Welcome back to me and to you and to uh, whatever. Today I'm going to talk about infrared photography. What is it? What does it look like? And how you can do it. So let's get started. As you may recall from your high school physics class, the visible light that you normally photograph makes up only a small portion of the complete electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. Now, what we're concerned with in this video is a chunk of the spectrum that's known, that's referred to as near IR, uh, which is about 750 nanometer wavelength to 1400 nanometer or so. Uh, and that makes up pretty much the whole range that modified cameras can typically image. What does that look like, you ask? Well, it looks something like this. Pretty weird, huh? Okay, so I cheated a little bit with that one. Uh, that camera actually has a 665 nanometer IR conversion filter on it, which means it's imaging a little bit of visible red light uh, as well as near infrared, and that's why it had that really wild false color effect. There are a lot of different filter options uh, when it comes to IR imaging, and you don't have to go for false color, and, but I chose that one simply because it gave me more flexibility in Photoshop uh, when it comes to either creating false color IR or fine-tuning uh, black and white IR images. Here are a few examples of some of my early experimenting uh, with that particular uh, IR conversion. Well, infrared photography today is kind of tricky. In the old days of film, you could go out and purchase infrared film uh, and some infrared filters and just go wild, and with a lot of practice, produce amazing images. With digital, however, you really only have two options. The first and least expensive option is to buy a filter that goes on the end of your lens here uh, that blocks visible light and allows infrared light only to pass. Uh, one of the old but very popular options for that would be the Hoya R72 filter, which is a 720 nanometer filter, so it passes light with wavelengths longer than 720 nanometers. The downside to this approach is that the filter stack that is integrated into most cameras' sensors blocks the vast majority of infrared. Now, these filters are not 100% effective, so you can still screw that Hoya filter onto the end and take infrared images, you just end up having to use really, really long time exposures um, to you know, capture enough light to have a properly exposed image. This approach can limit you creatively because obviously there are only so many subjects you can photograph if you're dealing with really, really long time exposures. So you'll end up with a lot of motion blur if you're trying to photograph anything that's moving, like water, um, tends to get really smeary at the long time exposures. Anytime you're photographing outdoors and there's a little bit of a breeze, you'll end up with a lot of motion blur. That said, I have seen some really amazing work using this least expensive and very simple approach to infrared photography. The second option is a bit more extreme, but does provide a lot more creative flexibility when it comes to infrared imaging. That option is doing a conversion on your camera. This is going to require a spare camera body that you're willing to dedicate solely to infrared imaging. And that's a lot to ask for with most amateur photographers. Now there are a lot of places you can go to have a camera modified, but the two that come to mind for me uh, are LifePixel and MaxMax, Max, and they offer a wide array of different filter options. The procedure basically involves removing the infrared filter from the filter stack uh, on your camera here, and replacing it with a different filter, in this case a 665 nanometer filter, so uh, the only light being passed to the sensor of this camera is light whose wavelength is 665 nanometers or longer. So it blocks the vast majority of all visible light, um, but passes a very high percentage of infrared light, which means that your exposure times come back down to about where you would expect them to be for visible light. Now that said, uh, don't expect your in-camera light meter or your handheld light meter to be very useful to you when you're imaging in infrared because neither of those systems are calibrated for metering infrared light. So you're really going to have to rely on live view and just eyeballing it and doing a lot of bracketing because uh, it's, it's difficult to predict exactly uh, what, settings, what settings are going to expose properly when you're photographing light that you can't see. Tip number one, white balance your camera to an extreme green. 
plants, green lawns, things like that work very well, and this is a very important step. Number two, shoot in JPEG plus RAW mode. This way you'll have both a RAW file to mess around with as well as a reference file in JPEG form. Tip number three, use live view to focus and compose your image. This is important because your camera's viewfinder-based focusing system is not calibrated for infrared light and will, for the most part, always back focus or otherwise improperly focus your images. Tip number four is bracket, bracket, bracket. As you can see here, you can't really rely on your camera's built-in light meter. It's indicating we're almost a full stop under, and yet things look about right. As I adjust closer to the recommended exposure, you can see things look hugely overexposed. Again, the metering systems are not designed for metering infrared light, so you kind of have to use live view as your guide and just sort of wing it, and obviously bracket a whole lot to make sure you get what you're actually out for. Well, that's it for this video. Don't forget to check out part two where I talk about post-processing infrared images, working with raw files, and all that jazz. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Also, subscribe. Click anywhere to see part two.